In Turkey today, the face of authority wears a helmet, carries a rifle, the unrelenting face of a military takeover. The Turkish army carried out their bloodless coup just before dawn on Friday, September the 12th. They detained the Prime Minister, the major party leaders and the heads of labour unions. They dissolved government and parliament. They outlawed political parties. The state of siege already covered half the country. The military extended it throughout Turkey. Their stated purpose, to halt years of terrorism, economic depression, political paralysis, to stem growing religious militancy. This, they say, is a benign coup. Here's the coup leader, General Evren. He's a proven moderate. The people know him for his democratic spirit. They know he's a reluctant military dictator. So why this coup, the third in Turkey in 20 years? One major reason, terrorism by far leftists and rightists has continued, while sterile quarrels between parties paralyzed the country's political life hindered their ability to maintain order. Political violence has claimed 2,000 lives this year. The job of keeping order fell primarily on the army. But Evren warned the solution lay in the hands of parliament, not with the martial law commanders. The military, he said, shouldn't have a political role. Yet, with the politicians helpless, the army felt they had to intervene to prevent total collapse. That's all. The Turkish press are local. Since January, the general demanded the politicians work together to keep order. He was ignored. He now believes the old political system failed the country. He's promised a return to democracy after forming a new constitution. It'll probably propose a popularly elected president and strengthen Turkey's two-party system. Electorally, that's likely to favor the conservatives, the very group the generals have now overthrown. The goal is to prevent the kind of political violence that's peaked this year. This is how troops rooted out leftists from a factory last winter. In the months before the coup, leftists and rightists set up marginal power centers parallel with official authorities so-called liberated areas of major cities or in country enclaves. Behind this parallel political power, a parallel economy also. A kind of Turkish mafia, largely financed by immigrants. A black market, founded on arms and drug smuggling. It was at their funerals that the leftists turned out in force. Here, a union leader had been shot. The fear of a communist offensive may have been a major factor in the general's decision to take over. The banned Turkish communists had always condemned leftist violence. But recently, they'd begun organizing violent demonstrations. Also, Turkish-Soviet relations had worsened. The Turkish communist pirate radio, based in East Germany, called on all Turkish leftists to move against the regime. Leftist terrorism may have been fueled by Eastern Bloc influence, Hatred of the rightist assassination squads really mobilized the whole far left. Here's the assassinated leader's widow. The deposed Prime Minister, Suleiman Demir, a conservative, he made a comeback after already being deposed by the last two or nine years ago. Before this coup, he'd refused to enter a coalition of the opposition. He'd refused to enter a coalition of the opposition. Demirel's parliamentary alliance with smaller parties had become unworkable. He wanted new elections. The opposition leader, Bulent Edjevit, rejected the call for elections. He's a social democrat. He'd been alternating in power with Mr. Demirel. But this man, Neometin Abakan, was a new factor in the seemingly endless power struggle between conservatives and social democrats. Mr. Abakan was president of the Islamic National Salvation Party. They've been openly defying the government demanding a new religious authority and sometimes violent protests. 
The resurgence of Islamic influence in Turkey has been a major factor behind this coup. The non-religious foundations of the state are the very basis of Kemalism, the legacy of Kemal Ataturk, founder of modern Turkey. So the generals, guardians of that legacy, could only be furious when, a week before the coup, a pro-Islamic rally brought together 50,000 people. Some of them sat down during the national anthem. They paraded green flags, banners in Arabic, anti-Kemalist slogans. They were demanding a new religious authority in the country whose founding principles exclude that very idea. For the generals, here was a further threat to the nation. An impartial president could maybe have symbolized some reconciliation amid a divided country. But the parliament, spectacularly helpless, couldn't elect a president in 150 ballots spread over five months. The generals now say the politicians should have been reorganizing the administration, improving social conditions, education, and labor relations. Instead, party rivals The principles of Kemalism were under attack. According to those principles, modern Turkey should be united, centralized, independent of religious influence. <laughs> Constitutionally, the armed forces are guardians and trustees of the Republic. This is their absolute historic legitimacy. So the generals, armed with this special prestige, felt it important to preserve the nation's structure. This is why they're hostile to ethnic separatist movements, why they resent the religious trends which threaten the foundations of the state, and why they even object to a liberal economy which could strip government of its wide control over business life. This special role makes their coup d'etat unlike most others. For months, people in Turkey had indeed been talking of a different kind of takeover, not by the generals, but by the captains, young middle-class nationalistic officers inclining towards the third world and favoring Islam as an affirmation of their family values. But official Turkey has rejected those values. It wants to become a modern European nation. So the Evren coup could well be a response to the disruptive influence of these young officers. In this context, it's clear why General Evren stresses the importance of military hierarchy and discipline. After both modern Turkey's previous coups, the military have always returned power to civilians in the true Kemalist tradition. But in the first coup, 20 years ago, the military hierarchy wasn't respected. There were junior officers in the junta. Prime Minister and his associates were condemned to death or prison. Not this time, say officials, with generals firmly in charge. In the last coup, nine years ago, the military let the National Assembly continue. This time, they're governing directly. All the more important, then, the hierarchy be honored. The Turkish general staff had other reasons for the coup. They were angered by the American arms embargo after their Cyprus invasion six years ago. Their weapons became outdated, not adapted to a dynamic role within NATO. Now, this year, agreements with the US on bases and supplies of modern weapons have given the military renewed ambitions, a new role, a new mood. The burden of maintaining order obviously hindered those ambitions. The U.S. denies prior knowledge of the coup, but Turkey has a strategic NATO role and ultra-modern monitoring stations, and there are suspicions the Americans may at least have given their go-ahead. The Truman Doctrine guarantees U.S. defense of the status quo between Greece and Turkey. Neither of the superpowers has tolerated disruption of a country in its European zone of influence. The military must also have been concerned how the political paralysis was affecting the still fragile economy. 
how an impression of disorder could undermine confidence abroad and dry up the financial aid still vital to Turkey's economic future. The government has pledged an unchanged policy that will honor its foreign debts. At home, it's suspended labor disputes and given a large wage rise. That won't help the generals pull the economy out of the recession caused by the mid-70s oil crisis. But business leaders are satisfied with the coup. They appreciate the keynote of continuity. But the crucial tests are ahead. How will the regime handle the deep-rooted problems of social inequality at the source of political violence? The rapid trend of movement towards the cities. Very high unemployment. The despair of ethnic or religious minorities oppressed by Turkish nationalism and by poverty. <laughs> Another major problem for the generals will be how to handle terrorists. Over the last year, the army has faced many situations like this, rounding up leftist suspects after a plant occupation. In cases of arbitrary arrest and torture, a familiar scourge when soldiers fight terrorism. Only this summer, General Evren said terrorists will be pulverized under the fist of the Turkish army and will drown in the blood they cause to flow. In the moderate face of the new regime, these violent words have been quickly forgotten. So the general's problem will be to eliminate terrorism without widespread violent repression. Repression that could cause only bitterness and resentment among the Turkish people. The new regime will want to avoid more scenes like these. Rightists. This is Al Paslan Türkes, leader of a major rightist party. He's now detained. He'll probably face trial. He's known for his links with neo fascist terror groups. Observers will watch closely to see whether the generals treat the rightists as harshly as the left. Any connivance with the right could undermine the new regime's image abroad. When General Evren met the world's press after the coup, he was well aware that a moderate stance is important. Economically, because countries providing aid will see human rights in Turkey as a major consideration. And politically, because NATO could exclude a repressive regime. These factors alone should ensure the generals avoid collusion with the right and avoid the excesses of repression. Silahlı kuvvetlere de sızarak birkaç yılda onu da bölme yoluna gidecekler. So it looks as if this takeover will indeed prove to be a benign coup. But there have been others before this one, and in the end, they've solved nothing for the people of this country. In time, the present military rulers will probably hand back to the civilians. But the roots of Turkey's problems will have to be tackled. Otherwise, this coup won't be the last.